Welcome to Digital Doc Games, the channel all about games and health. If that sounds interesting to you, make sure you like this video, share, and hit that follow or subscribe button. That's the best way to support me and the channel and ensures you'll never miss new content. Today, I am really excited to talk about another game coming out dealing with the topic of health. That game is Back Then, an adventure game about a poet diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And to tell us all about it, we are joined by the game's lead developer, Ruben, and streamer extraordinaire, and the voice of Catherine in the game, Nega Oryx. Ruben, Nega Oryx, thank you so much for being here today. How are you guys? I'm thank doing great. Us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. I'm excited to talk about the game. It is my pleasure. I'm so thrilled. The I, I was we were talking a little bit before we we hit the live button, but Nega Oryx, your community is coming out strong here at Digital Doc Games. <laughs> the hype emojis are flying. We have I, I was saying I kept had to have, um, needing to increase my Twitch follower goal on the bottom of the screen there because every time I did it, you guys were just following more and more. So like, it's a good problem to have, but, and there we go. Thank you, uh, Runable for the follow. Welcome to the care team. It's, it's such an amazing problem to have. So this is really fun. Guys, I wanted to really just jump in it. And, and for this one, um, and, and before we do start, since there are so many new people here, just so you guys know, um, I do my best to kind of uh, keep an eye on the chat. If you have any questions, and I'll open it up at the end of the show uh, specifically for this, but as we go, if you have any questions, certainly don't be afraid to ask them, and we can see if, uh, if our lovely guests can answer those questions for you. Um, let's start with a little bit of an icebreaker for whoever doesn't know who you guys are. So we'll start with Ruben, because I have a feeling that mm -hmm. more people in the chat maybe know a little bit more about Nega Oryx. Um, but Point Ruben, <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and your icebreaker question is, what has been your game of the pandemic? My game of the pandemic? Your game of the pandemic. There's all this talk, right? Animal Crossing is the game of the pandemic, but what has been your game of the pandemic? Right. So hi, I'm Ruben and I spent most of my pandemic days playing Doom Eternal in order to escape real life. <laughs> Is that a good answer? I think that's, um, that's the I best answer. I played a lot of Doom Eternal on, during the pandemic days, at least when I started a year ago. That was my go-to game for a while. Yeah, what and what was it about Doom? I don't know, just a power fantasy, I guess. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I haven't and picked I, that one up yet, but it's it's on my list. And I did I did play a bit of Animal Crossing as well because who hasn't played Animal Crossing at this stage? It's such a lovely game and it's so good just to, again, escape for a little while and relax. 100%. And uh, yeah. That, awesome. Those, the, basically those two were my go-to games. I like it. And I did not give you guys time to prep. So I appreciate you being quick on the trigger with those ones, literally with Doom, right? Um, <laughs> Nega Oryx, how about you? For anyone who doesn't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself and what's been your game of the pandemic. Yeah, uh, if anyone doesn't know me, my name is Nega Oryx. I'm a full-time variety streamer, voice actor, a freelance host, tabletop RPG player, and I co-host a book club on Twitch as well. Wait, so is, that, do... is that all? Uh, well, you know, I've been slacking this past year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to work harder next year. Uh, I would say I've probably had three games of the pandemic that I have mostly played off stream. They've been my, like... I need to quiet my mind and not talk to other humans. And these are games I can just like laser beam focus and on. <laughs> and it would be Planet Coaster. Okay. Uh, Two Point Hospital. Okay. And Ooblets. Okay. Ooblets. Ooblets is so good. Ooblets is amazing. It's so, so, so good. And it's only an early access. So it's only going to keep getting better as they work on it. Um, I love Ooblet so much that I maxed out all of the content you could do on my desktop and my laptop. I made two <laughs> different save files of it. I love Ooblets and Planet Coaster. I actually used to work at Disneyland. Oh my God. Uh, and it was the job that I loved the most prior to streaming. What did you so, do at Disneyland? 
Uh, I was a part of the Disney College program. So I started off in food service and okay. then uh, I actually injured my spine while I was working there. So they put me on something called transitional duty uh -huh. where you show up every day and they just assign you to a different place. You wear a different costume every day. And I would either be in the back of house at restaurants, just like putting wax paper on plastic trays over and over for eight hours at a time, <laughs> or I would get to be a greeter and I would just pin trade with guests, tell people where the bathrooms were, yeah. wave during parades. Like right. that was the best. That was the most fun role. It, it's uh, such, and I, that's such a I cool a thing lot. because like, oh man, when you think about Disney, I've never been to Disneyland, but I've been to Disney World, but that similar thing of it all works so perfectly in harmony, but it's all working because of those individuals. That's a very cool thing, like to be part of that community. So that's really neat. Yeah, it was really special. And it, a lot of what I learned there carried over really well to streaming, I think. You know, a lot of what we were taught was the guests that you're interacting with, it might be the only time they ever get to come to this theme park. So treat it like it's the only interaction they're gonna have with a cast member. Make it special, make it memorable, make them feel seen and heard and appreciated. And right. I think carrying that over into content creation works really well. Yeah. You know, that's how you want your community to feel is seen and heard and right. respected. It, it, it's interesting. Basically one way to start. Making video, <laughs> sorry, I'm um, yeah. No, but oh my god. She just nailed it. She just nailed it right on the dot because that's basically how the Outriders team was formed. It's just kind of a necessity in order to us to creatively express ourselves, right? And especially nowadays, where it's, there's so much competition and so many things being done constantly on a daily basis, and we just kind of wanted something different outside of the box. Actually, we like to say that there's no box at all because that makes more sense in our heads. Yeah. And that's kind of how this game was born as well. It was born out of a necessity for us to vent more or less because it affects, this is an illness that affects not only me personally indirectly, but as, as well as all my team mem members. And it's a very poignant theme to talk about in the video game. And it's something that's very personal to me as well. Right. So having this opportunity and having, you know, so many people already interested in the game and what it has to say and the scenes it's exploring, it's, it's incredible. And it's something that wouldn't be possible unless, you know, the whole content creation world wasn't the same. Right, right, right. It, it's really interesting to me, and we'll get into, I want to dive into what exactly you guys are making um, together. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> it's, it's really interesting to me to figure out, like, what skills go into content creation and how that can be brought in or, or, or game development, like you said, Ruben, and how that can be brought in from other areas of life or other inspirations. So Nega Oryx, you mentioned, you know, Disneyland and that crossover and Ruben, you mentioned your personal uh, experiences with illness. For me, it's interesting, you know, in medical school, I was trained to inter to do the patient interview, right? and how much that translated over to now doing podcast interviews or Twitch interviews like this. Um, it, it's just really, really cool to see. So it's always interesting for me to hear other people's stories of how other places in their lives have crossed over. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. I, I want to jump into the game. And Ruben, you, you gave us a little, a nice taste, got our feet wet. Um, okay. so, so this game is called Back Then. Like we said, it's about a, a poet who is diagnosed or who, who lives with Alzheimer's and his experience, Nega Oryx, you play Catherine, who is the main character's uh, daughter, I believe. Um, Ruben, tell us a little bit about this game. What type of game is it? What type of experience can a player expect to have when they play back then when it does release? So back then is a narrative-driven adventure game about Salma Selian, who E-I-L-E-I-N, by the way, which is the word time in Latin. Crazy stuff, I know. Incredible. <laughs> and it's a first-person game, obviously, and it's focused on a lot on interactions, puzzles, and detective exploration. Um, basically, the best way I can compare the game to other similar games is yeah. it would be layers of fear without the horror. Okay. If that makes sense. So 
it, play layers of fear, but remove all the horror elements, put in a lot more puzzles and a lot more emphasis on the narrative, and you have back then. That's right. the whole gist of it. Right. Um, it's very artsy, it's very painterly, and it's very metaphorical. And it seems that it dives into uh, go beyond just Alzheimer's because we want to focus on the family as well and how the disease kind of not only deteriorates the patient himself, in this case Thomas, but also kind of destroys all the family ties that that person would would be able to go along if otherwise, oh God, I can't stop right now, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you're, you're doing great. It would, it would mean a lot if, you know, that person didn't lose all their memories. So how would they even react? What are the stages? How would the family members react to that? And of course, each of them would have a different reaction. Some could go into rage. Some could just mm. flat out deny it exists. And some would just face it, I guess, and just tackle all that weight on their shoulders. Right. And right. we want to showcase a little bit of each of those details in every single character. And this is where Nagorix comes in with her character as well. Because right. Catherine is kind of like the very smarty pants child that never was able to <laughs> actually have a great connection after Salmas was diagnosed with the illness. And that she, she she's actually in the first chapter of the game, minor spoiler, because <laughs> it's kind of like the start of the downhill battle that Thomas will face. It's the calm before the storm, right? If you will, right? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's interesting to me. You mention capturing illness not only from the perspective of the one who suffers from the illness, but of of his loved ones, of the people around yeah. him. This is now the, the second game um, that we've talked about on this channel uh, through an interview that sort of does that. Uh, I think our last interview was The Cost of Recovery, which is another game coming out later this year about a child who suffers from a stroke, and you play as the, as the different characters in the family. Do you get to ever play as Catherine, or are you experiencing the whole game through Thomas's point of view? No, you only play with Thomas throughout the whole game. Right, right. But so, all the side characters will show up over the course of the game with very poignant scenes and backstories that yeah. all tie up to the main narrative. So Ruben, you mentioned having a, a personal experience, uh, and, and I know you mentioned to me offline that other members of the Outriders team also have a personal experience with Alzheimer's, and I want to get to that. But before I do, um, Nega Oryx, when you were approached with the concept of this game about a character who suffers from Alzheimer's and playing his daughter, what was your thought in taking on that role? Is there something that you draw on from your life in a similar way that Ruben and the rest of the team does? How did you get into that headspace? Yeah, I have a little bit of a different tie to it in that I had a family member who didn't have Alzheimer's, but uh, he did end up having dementia uh, in probably the last year or so of his life as a result of uh, the terminal cancer mm -hmm. that he had. And that was my stepdad, who was such an influential figure in my life um, that inspired was the one that inspired me to start streaming in the first place wow. and it was it was almost like grieving before he had even passed mm. seeing him you know i i was in my 20s at the time and depending on the day that you talked to him he would ask when we were graduating high school he would ask you know, when we were going to have our Halloween carnival that we used to do in elementary school. Um, by the end of things, he remembered my sister and I as being like seven and eight years old. Wow. Um, and it resonated so strongly with me reading the way that Catherine responded to seeing what was happening to her father, because I think for many of us, we have this idealized version of how we would be like the perfect family member if that happened to a loved one you know we want to believe that we would do everything right and right. and put their needs before our own all the time in every situation and i think humans are so complex and the way we respond to trauma 
is so so nuanced and unpredictable. Um, one of the things that really drew me to this story in particular is that all of the kids are unique in the ways that they feel about the situation and the way that they either do or don't interact with Thomas uh, after what happens with him, you know, right. kind of just seeing that um, the process of being a loved one to someone who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's is not a one size fits all kind of role. Right. And it just seemed like they handled the story with such care. It was so clear to me that it was something that must be personal to them just based on the description that I read and, and the way that it was handled. Right. Um, I literally was just like, I'll read for anything. I'll read for any character. Just put me in this thing. <laughs> That's incredible. And the fact that you got Catherine, which it sounds like on so many levels, I mean, thank you for sharing that story. That that I'm really excited even more so now to play this game. I mean, that must be just a really powerful performance. Um, it, it's interesting to me, you know, we talk a lot about impactful games here on this channel. And what that means is, you know, the games that you play that hit you in the feels, right? Something that, not that there's anything wrong with games for entertainment, but something that's, that's even a step above that, right? Something, what are you taking from that game? That can be a lot of different things. One of my favorite impactful games is The Last of Us 2. And the reason I love The Last of Us 2 is because they do such a fantastic job of not only teaching and in some ways forcing empathy at you, um, but trying to show this message of this world is alive and every single character, whether they are a main character, character or an NPC, has their own story and what's happening in the world affects them differently. And that is something that is so true in life and especially is important to know now in 2021 when there's all these horrible cases, cases of racism, anti-Semitism, you know, all these of, of not understanding the other person to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And I think it's so interesting, Ruben and Nega Oryx, what you guys are doing with this game of bringing that to illness, which is so true too, which is it's not just the person suffering from the disease, it's everyone. Everyone, like you said, Nega Oryx, has to deal with that in its own way. Um, so to me, it's so fascinating. So here's an here's a open question to both of you. I gave a little bit of a background on sort of why I see games uh, as such an important medium in my, in my little monologue right there. Um, <laughs> what do you think makes a video game the right platform for the story of back then? And we can start with Ruben. Well, video games have one very good thing about them is that you actually play them. And unlike movies or books or TV shows, you're not a passive observator of what you're watching or experiencing, you're actually going through it. So in a way, that can help a lot to just identify and explain or just even lightly explore a lot of themes. Just the just the simple act of I'm a character in a video game and I can interact with my surroundings I can do a lot, a lot. And it's something very simple. It's just the way you meticulously build everything and construct everything and tie everything together that makes it work and makes it tick. But I think video games in general are obviously a work of art, otherwise I wouldn't even work in this industry. Right. And it's something that in general still has a lot of ways to go in terms of mental illness exploration. And I am working on a side project about anxiety for VR platforms as well, Wow. which is something that really drives me a lot because it's something I also relate to personally a lot. And at least to me, this whole industry and this whole video game creation deal that I've got going on is basically just me venting. And I like to treat it as a writer writing a book, but instead of me writing books, I program video games. Right. That's the only difference. Yeah. All the emotions, all the feelings, all the trauma I went to are all in that game. If I could just, and, and, and maybe I will, but I'm gonna grab that 
that that that statement, Ruben, because one of the wonderful things about this channel is here on Twitch, we're surrounded by gamers in the community here. Again, the community coming strong today. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, but over on, on YouTube and podcasts and Twitter, a, a lot of the audience for Digital Doc Games isn't necessarily from gaming. Um, some are medical, some are you know more into the VR or digital health or whatever it is. And that's what I, what you just said, that's what I want them to understand is that video games are, have come a long way from their origins in the arcade and they are works of art now. And it, it is a alternative to a, an artist writing their story in a book, but doing it in this Don't new medium. <laughs> oh, it's, it's being used. It's being used. <laughs> Nega or how about you? Yeah, I really like what Ruben said about the difference between kind of being a passive observer of film, for instance, versus an active participant in a video game. I think something that's so unique about, you know, why this game needs to be a video game uh, is agency, really, which I right. think is true of so many impactful games who aim to impart knowledge on the viewer or deepen their understanding of the world or people different from them or you know conditions that they may not have been aware of i always use the example of for instance why horror games are so much scarier to me than horror films yeah and for me if a scary movie is really frightening me i go like this that's what i do no right. shame right. i just put my hand up and cover my eyes and then when the sounds stop and I can tell I can keep watching, I just go, boop, oh, okay. And, right. and it has continued. It's like what I used game. to do as a kid when there was a kissing scene in a <laughs> TV exactly, show. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, I do the same for those too, you know? And <laughs> the thing with games is you can't wait for the game to progress without you. And I think it's such an important psychological thing, especially in regards to developing bonds with characters right. and feeling empathy especially from people who maybe that's not natural to them maybe they don't naturally have it easy with feeling empathetic towards other people or right. people that um they don't see face to face in real life right if you live in the middle of nowhere midwest in a town with like a hundred people Video games in particular allow you to step into the shoes of these characters and be complicit in their actions and their journeys. Right. Which I think, I love that you mentioned The Last of Us Part Two for that, because I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had in regards to The Last of Us and Part Two with player agency, right? Like there's some choices that you can make for those characters and there's some that you can't. Right. There's some that you physically, like the game will not progress unless you make a certain choice. Um, so even just looking at when games allow us to make choices versus when games force you to go down a set path, uh, I, I think it's such a unique experience for humans. And I hope that you know, your listeners and your viewers who might not be familiar with video games or how they have progressed today, I hope that's a takeaway for them is what a wonderfully immersive way it is to gain insight and empathy into the lives and lived experiences of people different from us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well said. Uh, I, I really liked the point you made about agency and that actually brings up sort of a follow-up question. Thinking about, I, I think that's true, that you, when you're playing a game, you do get this sense of agency. What's so interesting about a game being made about a character with dementia or Alzheimer's or really many types of, of illnesses, certainly um, old, you know, illnesses that affect older populations is, you often lose agency. And that's something that is very, very difficult and problematic for the, for the person who is experiencing that illness. And something that in the healthcare field, we try to promote as much as we can. It's not always so easy, but we try. When you're making a game where agency is a very important aspect, 
and the fact that you're playing as a character who forgets. How do you make that connection between the player and the character when the character, when the player will be remembering these things, but maybe the character doesn't? How does agency affect that? Well, there's a lot of game developer tricks that we can pull off in order to bridge the gap between the what the character is going through and what the player sees and experiences. Um, the other Alzheimer game that came out last year before I forget did a couple of these things, like the going into a room and then the room being completely different, right. the items disappearing and appearing depending on what the character is actually remembering at that point. There's a lot of neat little things and quirks to back then that make it a really, really special project because it divides itself into four chapters and each chapter is a season of the year and that represents a lot of different things for each season. Right. So not only is there different interactions and different things to see in every single chapter because not all of the rooms and all the mechanics will be available to you at the beginning, but the more and more you explore the game, the more you understand why that's happening, quote unquote. Why? Because obviously there's not an exact answer to that, but we can try our best to explain what's happening and how it progresses in the different stages and everything like that. And right. we'd also like to include a pamphlets, a lot of pamphlets in the game that have nothing to do with the main narrative, but are just deep exploration of how Alzheimer's actually works, the differences between Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, all the stages of Alzheimer's, the symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Because we feel like this would be a really big help in not only making the game have more context, but also teaching the players something new and something that they otherwise wouldn't have picked up through the game's metaphors and narrative. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I'm really glad that you mentioned uh, Before I Forget, because obviously that's a game that comes to mind, it deals with a similar mm -hmm. subject. Uh, Sunita in that game is the main character. She doesn't suffer from Alzheimer's, but she has early onset dementia. That was actually the first developer interview that I was lucky enough to be able to do on this channel uh, with Chella and Claire, who are wonderful. So if you're interested in this topic, go check that out on podcasts or YouTube. Um, and one interesting thing, I mean, you mentioned some game developer tricks that one that comes to mind from before I forget that was interesting is they discovered that there are certain objects uh, or patterns or textures that someone with dementia should avoid in having uh, in their house, like a rug that's patterned um, and the way that they'll actually um, uh, see that rug, perceive that rug is actually like maybe even like a black hole as something that if they step in, they'll fall or they can't pass and, and that can cause, you know, some trauma. Um, and that's something that they were able to put in the game, like you said, as an education component, which sounds like uh, back then is doing as well, but also, like you said, as a game mechanic to keep you from progressing into a certain area of the house until they were ready for you to, per to go into that area. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and that's another way that games... Details. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, even little details like the writing in the game, like someone who's suffering from Alzheimer's isn't going to have the same type of writing that they would have pre-Alzheimer's, right? Yeah. So we did. We actually like did research on that. And even in terms of like colors and the patterns that you mentioned as well, they're all very important things to have in the game in order to display what you shouldn't have or to do exactly the opposite in order to show you exactly what you need to have. Right, right. In order to deal with the illness that someone is dealing with themselves. Right. And back then is really a battle from beginning to end. It goes through all the stages. It shows you a bit of everything. And at the end, it leaves you open-ended with what did you get from it? Because that's really, that's really the key to this whole game is to have the player reach the end and have a lot of thoughts yeah. and actually dwell on what just happened and think about it and sort of analyze all the happenings and all the metaphors in the game because that's that's where the meat is in the game. It's right. the whole how the game environment is shaping according to Thomas's illness and how it all unravels as the player progresses through the game. Right.
Yeah, that, that'll definitely be an interesting one to unpack. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely play it on stream. Um, and I'm excited to kind of have that, that book club, you know, conversation after it uh, about, you know, unpacking it. I'm, I'm so excited. Um, so Ruben, you actually kind of already led into my next question. So I'll, I'll address this one to Nega Oryx. Um, what would you like someone to walk away with after playing this game, and I'll specify it uh, even more. I mean, uh, certainly answer that first part of the question, but also, what would you like someone to walk away with in terms of how they, of what they take away from Catherine? I think the biggest umbrella answer would be empathy, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, I think video games are such a powerful tool for empathy. And especially when it comes to subjects revolving around any kind of illness or disease or loss or grief, I think they are subjects that often people need to talk about the most or need the most support for, but so many of us feel uncomfortable broaching those subjects with our friends. You know, you, you don't know how to bring it up. You don't know what kind of support they need you might not even really be familiar with what they or their loved ones are going through. And oftentimes it almost feels like a little bit of a, like a taboo of just asking plainly, you know, it, it seems like a subject that a lot of people kind of shy away from. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for me personally, um, I, for instance, with the game Hellblade, I had a loved one with dissociative identity disorder right. who had very recently been diagnosed and I didn't know anything about it, anything about it at all. It sounded so big and so scary from everything that I'd seen like on TV and in movies. And as soon as I played the game and was able to see even just one character's perspective of what it's like living with it, it completely changed wow. my understanding of it and really opened the door for me to feel comfortable diving more into the research of it, learning more about it, educating myself better, reading other people's perspectives. And it it kind of lit that spark for me to educate myself more. Yeah. And I really hope for that, sure. you know, people who play back then, I hope that it provides a higher level of empathy and, you know, obviously in relation to people with Alzheimer's, but also just in terms of elderly folks in general, Yeah, I think something that's a, a topic really near and dear to my heart is the way so often when we age, family members often leave us behind or don't engage with us the same way anymore. Um, if someone lives in an assisted care facility, oftentimes they don't get many visits. They don't get the same level of care and attention that they may have received in years prior. And I hope it develops a stronger, a stronger link to that demographic and the, the desire to be more empathetic to, to them. Uh, and in particular with Catherine, I really want those who have struggled with loss and with grief of any kind to see depictions of how so many different individuals can handle it and to recognize that there's no one way to process something that so often feels incomprehensible to us. Um, I, I hope that it leaves people with almost like philosophical questions mm. about, you know, does the universe care about us or is Camus right? And is it all just kind of the, uh, uh, what does he say? The gentle indifference of the world, right, you know? Right. I want people to kind of walk away from the game questioning those things yeah. and talking about those things. and maybe rethinking their own connection to memories and to time and, and to the way we understand them. Right. Right. Uh, it's, that's brilliant. And I, I totally echo 
that experience that you had playing Hellblade and for me, you know, before I forget and, and similar games, I, I've said it, but I don't know if I've ever said it sort of on stream, but, but certainly I have never, I, I've, I have treated and helped care for many, many patients with dementia, with bipolar, with schizophrenia, with men, many mental health illnesses. And I've always enjoyed the care, uh, you know, taking care of those patients. And I thought I understood them, but until I played those games, I, I, it just brought my understanding of what they may be going through to a whole different level. And it sounds like back then, like you both are saying, like that's, that's the mission here. Like that's the goal. Um, I mean, just, yeah, I mean, one, one quick story, like, by the time I was in my fourth year of medical school and I was doing some rotations at that point, I had already decided to work into in games for health and not to continue seeing patients inside of the hospital after school. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to get the most out of this experience as I can. Um, and in, in, you know, downtown DC in the heart of DC, mental health, uh, issues were, were very common and the types of patients that we would see, um, you know, the homeless, people on the street uh, with, you know, schizophrenia. And, and, and these things are almost what I became accustomed to over the four years that I was there. And I said, you know, I'm going to take the time in my, my off time when I've finished everything I need to do as far as my work goes at the hospital. I'm just going to walk around and I'm going to spend some time. And, and it was Hellblade that inspired this, which was let me, let me sit and talk to these patients, these people. Let me, let me see what their story is. What is their perspective? How did, what is their upbringing? What is their background? Um, so it was, it was really, those games have meant a lot to me is really what I'm trying to say. And, and it sounds like that, that those um, sentiments are, are shared for sure. Um, as we wind down the interview, uh, I, I wanna invite the chat, um, any questions uh, that you may have. I, I've seen some have, have been asked, I apologize if I've missed them, but, but go ahead, I'm, I'm looking now. Um, Nick on demand, uh, by the way, Nick, thank you for being here, um, asked a, a question actually that, that I had as well for Ruben. Uh, he, he asked, why was the occupation of Thomas chosen to be a poet? There's actually two reasons for this. One is that it makes a lot of sense to have a protagonist that writes about his own experiences, especially when we're dealing with a mental illness topic. Hmm. And the second is that it makes the narrative flow better because in the main character is a very artistic and a very expressionist character that kind of lingers throughout his whole family and each individual family member has like an art quick kink that I've been calling it. Every single one of them does something different. And it, again, it ties to the whole family aspect of, of back then and how we want to deconstruct everything and leave the players with feelings of existentialism by the end. Right, right. No, that's so interesting. Again, that, that interplay of game design and narrative, but also, you know, the subjects that you're dealing with. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I, I, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. So if you have any, go ahead and get them in. Um, I do want to take this time just to, again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, everyone that's new to the Digital Doc family here, Hefty Goof, I see you sharing the hearts. Thanks for being here. Um, Sophista, Tattooish, thank you for following. Um, if, if you liked what you've seen, go ahead and jump over to YouTube on podcast, whatever your platform of choice, you can find me. You see all my tags here. Um, and, and really, it's, it's been such a, a pleasure to, to speak with um, Ruben and Nega Oryx today. Ruben, if people want to find out more about back then, if they want to uh, track this game, where can they do that? Wishlist the game on Steam, follow our Twitter page and our Instagram. Those are where we are the most active. And if you want to join our Discord community as well, you're very welcome to do so because similar to next year, we're also trying to establish a lovely community and hopefully raise a lot more awareness and use back then as a platform to raise said awareness. Awesome. So, awesome. And I forgot yeah, to ask, right? by the way, I, I, I always get nervous asking this question to a developer, but I have to. It's my duty as a okay. quote unquote video game journalist now. 
When's it coming out? September. Sep okay. Okay. September, guys, in for PlayStation and PC. Is that right? Yeah, for PS5 and PC to start off with. If every single is according to plan, we'd like to release this game on the Switch as well. Wonderful. But that's not confirmation or anything. We still have to see what happens. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and before I jump to some comments in the chat here, Nega Oryx, if people want to go see your awesome streams, which by the way, have the best music I tweeted at you yesterday, uh, where can they do that? I am Nega Oryx on all social platforms. That's N-E-G-A-O-R-Y-X. Uh, Twitter is the best place to stay up to date with, you know, voiceover announcements, hosting gigs that I'm doing, TTRPG shows I'm on, going live posts for streams. I do a lot in a lot of places, so Twitter and our community Discord are the best two places to be for that. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm excited to hop into some future streams. Uh, before we close, just a couple comments I saw. L Squish says, as someone who has had a grandma suffer with dementia and my partner's maternal and paternal grandmother suffered dementia, it's a very touchy topic for me. Do you think I'd find back then comforting to cope with those emotions? It's interesting because the description L Squish gave is kind of similar to my own because I have both my great grandparents. Yes, they're still alive somehow. Um, they both have Alzheimer's and I lost my grandpa in 2013 to liver failure. But before that, he also had a lot of symptoms of early Alzheimer's and dementia. And this game, at least for me, it serves as catharsis and it serves as, you know, me venting everything that I've been through over, over the past few years. But at the same time, I'd say it goes case, on a case by case basis, right, because right. this game is very, it's a fiction, it's a, obviously it's a, fiction, a fictitious story, but it's very grounded in reality. And some of the things that we want to show in the game might not be particularly good for someone who's going through a lot of stuff. And it's very important for us to actually say that at the very beginning of the game, we have a warning and everything. Right. Because we are dealing with very, very serious and very touchy topics. And I say that to myself as well, because sometimes it's very hard to work on this game because all the memories and everything just comes flooding back in. If it would give you comfort, maybe not, but it would give you understanding. Right, right. So maybe you can find comfort through that understanding, if that makes sense. Yeah. I found a nice way to kind of poke around to see if a game might be a good fit, if there are maybe some triggers inside that game, is hop on a stream and like see someone playing it um, for a little bit and maybe see how that goes and if it's something you want to... Obviously, it's hard with narrative games sometimes, but see if that's something you want to experience yourself or just watch or maybe it's, it's not the right thing for you. Um, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, Nick On Demand, for, for modding today. He's going to have a list for me after this, like this command's not set, this command's not set, this command's not set. <laughs> the server wasn't equipped for all the love and all the conversation. Um, but again, a good problem to have. Uh, Neg Oryx, thank you so much for being here. Ruben, uh, this is digital.games. I hope you enjoyed. I'm Dr. Ahmed Fredman. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate every single one of you. I will see you next time on digital.games. <laughs> <laughs>